Well, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Kevin Keek and Mr. John Carlin to join me on the stage for a discussion about what we can expect from the underdogs at the Euros 2016. Um, I'm sure that uh, the ones, since we have uh, an attendance here that raised almost uh, half as many hands as are in here when I asked how many people are going to the uh, Euros that we don't have to spend a long time introducing Kevin Keegan, but he is, uh, <laughs> but, uh, he is among others, the, uh, or, or he um, managed a few clubs, including um, the England national team, uh, which he played for additionally, and uh, won the Ballon d'Or twice, reached, won the, the European Championship with Liverpool, which is, uh, it's, been a, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, it's quite a while. And, uh, it's started to be cruel. No, I'm saying it's been a while since <laughs> Liverpool won the European Championship, but it might be a short it, time for another one. It's that long ago, I can't remember, but the people, <laughs> some of the people here remind me when I come, yeah. so the Liverpool supporters in particular. That was 1977 when we won the European Cup, so it's, 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 only, it's only 40 years ago almost. Yeah. So. And we are also joined by John Carlin, who uh, has written quite extensively about not only football, but quite a bit about football. You've written about Iceland in Spanish. You've written about, your latest book is about uh, Oscar Pistorius and his trial in South Africa. You have written uh, both articles and the books that have turned into movies, such as both Invictus and Die Hard 4, an interesting combination there. Um, and a very interesting thing regarding football that you actually told me that you, you actually saw Diego Maradona play in Argentina before he went to Europe. I did indeed. How good was he then? Um, yeah, okay. That's Kevin it. Keegan played there, against there's, him. There's the answer. Ask, <laughs> ask Kevin Keegan. He knows more than I do. I wouldn't say I played against him. I spent about 20 minutes trying to catch him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can remember him going past me three times in, in about 10 seconds, and I thought, that's why I'm not a defender. I, I, <laughs> I think he was an outstanding, the best thing I ever saw. Him and George Best were the two greatest players I ever played against. Mm -hmm. And Maradona was just... He was just 19 when, when he went past me three times. So I, I see him now, and I'm, he's a little bit heavier now, so I think I'm going <laughs> to get my own back next time I go to see him. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to remind you here also in the hall that uh, you can participate in discussions here using the hashtag BizFootball, B-I-Z, football, that you might even see here on the, uh, on the screen um, using Twitter. But, uh, and later on, we will open the floor also for questions from the audience. Um, we are going to be discussing, well, among other things, what we can expect from the underdogs this summer. Um, well, all these teams already qualified, so they already showed that they can probably beat anyone. But how different is it to be in qualifiers and then actually show up on a big stage? If you're English, very difficult. Um, <laughs> it's it's a difficult thing. It was fantastic to hear the coach talking about what you've achieved here, you know, and, and of course, we were talking about it earlier on today, and, and the great thing about success, and it is a huge success, regardless of how much you play it down, is it, it just makes it necessary to find more success. It's, it's, it's something that it doesn't stop just because you're successful. The biggest impact that, that's happened here in Iceland is going to be on the kids, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds who are seeing this team go. They're the ones who in five, ten years will get the benefit of the inspiration. That's where it goes. It's the same, you know, I see it all the time with Liverpool fans. They come up to me, even here in Iceland, we've got a lot of Liverpool fans here tonight. Uh, if there's any Newcastle fans here, the bad news is you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, Everton lost 3-0. They, they need you back, Moisey. And uh, we're down, so it's a, a mixed blessing. But... Um, it was fantastic to hear the common sense and, and uh, the fact that you play everything down. But, you know, when you get in a dressing room, the things you do are often very different from what you say publicly. There's an answer for the press. And then when you get in a dressing room, that's when it starts. OK, we said that. That's what we have to say. They're a good team. You might think they're not. They're a good team. You're playing. But when you get in the dressing room, you have to have that belief. If you're going to go there, you have a chance of winning it. You're, you know, you've got a ticket in the lottery, like everybody else. Maybe I haven't got as many as some of the big teams, but 
And there you go. But, uh, you asked me about Maradona. He's very good. <laughs> no, um, no, can I just say something? Just, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm gonna do anything I say, I'll defer to Kevin Keegan, and he can say it's complete rubbish, and I shall just bow and admit it. But um, it just seems to me that if you're an underdog in this situation, like Iceland, like, for example, Costa Rica in the last World Cup, just to remind you of Costa Rica in the, in the 2014 World Cup, they were in a, in a group, not a relatively easy, heavy quotes, group as the one that Iceland has. They were in a group with Uruguay, Italy, England, Costa Rica. You know, imagine that group before the World Cup. Costa Rica, no chance. And they beat Uruguay, they beat Italy, England were very lucky to get a nil-nil draw against them, and they had a, a proud moment, was it not? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Costa Rica won the group, yeah. you know, amazingly. They played Greece in the next round, they beat Greece on penalties, and then they played against that mighty football nation, Holland. Um, and, and, and they lost only on penalties. Now, I remember looking at Costa Rica at the time and thinking, you know, how extraordinary this is. And I think Costa Rica is a team that you can, you can very reasonably say that Iceland is at the same or better level. Um, you know, I actually know Costa Rica. I used to live in Central America. I've been there many times. And I, th I think there's a kind of emotional advantage that these smaller countries come with, namely that they have a point to prove. You know, there's a certain element in the nicest possible way, there's a certain element of resentment that they're small and the others are big. And I've always believed that resentment is maybe one of the great motor forces for success in life generally, for better or for worse. I mean, where did, I mean, to give you a really extreme, shocking example, where did Nazism and Adolf Hitler come from? It came from a great big national resentment. It's a, and, and so many people who are successful in, in life generally, I mean, never mind Nazis, just, uh, just CEOs of companies, um, successful football players, managers, there's something that they had some kind of trauma or something of some kind when they were teenagers. I don't know, their mother didn't give them the chocolate that day um, or some <laughs> girlfriend let them down or whatever. And, and the, the, that element of resentment, whether it's a kind of, you know, shockingly awful one like some historical ones or so on, but, so, but certainly being the underdog, being smaller, it gives you that extra thing of proving a point. Proving a point is a hell of a powerful engine. And that's something that a team like Iceland has, which say, Spain will not have. And I don't know, I think it's just one element in the mix um, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna give Iceland that, that point of fury and desire. And I suspect a little bit more, maybe Ke uh, Kevin will disagree with this, but maybe a little bit more of that desperation and desire and point proving than a big established nation that's won big trophies before. Do you agree with that? No. <laughs> and, uh, can, yeah, I mean, it, it's the same thing we talked about early on today about rejection. You know, it, to some people it's the end of the world, for, but for other people it's just the spur they need. So you, you're talking about exactly. uh, how you react to it. It's not what happens to you, it's how you react to it. Uh, I, I can remember um, being told I was too small at uh, Doncaster Rovers. You may not know this team, but it's the greatest team in the world. Forget Real Madrid, <laughs> this is just secondary to Doncaster Rovers when you're born in Doncaster and they turned me down because I was small and Coventry City turned me down because I was small hmm. and in the end you know that was the best thing ever happened to me and so it's how you handle what is considered sometimes as failure but it can so you be. had a bit of a point of resentment and point to prove that uh, yes, yes all my life you know <laughs> if I think most footballers do have that because hmm. Uh, hmm. We're, we're from working class so straight away you know we the, the greatest point I think your coach made tonight, and I totally agree with him, is when people say to me, why are, why are the kids different now? Why? I, I think it's because we, our generation, we've given our kids everything we never had. So, you know, we've taken away from them some of the things that we have, that we blame them for not having, if you know what I mean. In other words, you know, we had to get a job, we had to have a paper round, we had to, you know, we had to walk two miles to the park to play football. Now, a different world, I know, we drive them because we're scared something will happen. Mm. We, 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 we drop them off at the games, we get them, we, we get them to the games, we, we, the boots are there, you know. When my father mm. took me for my first boots in Doncaster, 
I was looking at the new ones. I didn't realize there was second-hand boots, you know, in the corner. And my father said, come on, over here, son, you know, and I bought someone else's boots. So when you have that sort of upbringing in football, it, it drives you on. And that's why the South Americans now are more hungry and taking over a lot of the places. They say to me in England, why are the English kids not coming through? They just are losing this thing where they feel at eight and nine now in these academies, they've made it. Time to get to 10 or 11, they're professionals in their own mind. At the time to get to 12, 13, 14, they, they're there. And that is not a good thing. And that's why the James Vardy story back in England with Leicester is such a great story. Because it doesn't happen now. 26 years of age playing non-league football in Halifax. Goes to a club, a bigger club, Fleetwood Town. Yeah, makes a big move. And now is, is, is the... He's the player of the year in England, he's won a championship, he's playing for England. You know, so there's, there are the people all around you in every day of your life who can inspire you. He should be an inspiration to every kid who's 18, 19, and people are saying to him, you know, if you're 18, 19, and a club hasn't picked you up, you're not going to make it. Rubbish. You know, because there is James Vardy, you know, and he didn't play in the league till he was 26, and now he's going to the Euros. And if you don't win the Euros, I'm hoping England are going to win the Euros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know you're slightly more favourite than we are. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you beat Holland, but, and we never have. Yeah. <laughs> so the lesson from what you said and what uh, Javier said is that basically we should actually make our children suffer more. <laughs> Give them harder <laughs> lives. No, I mean, I'm, that's what I, you're saying. I, what, I, I, what's the alternative? What I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that you can't expect them to have the character you had when you, they haven't done the things you had to do. You know, that's what I'm saying. So we mustn't blame them because no. we've done it for all the right reasons. You know, I, I want you to have the things I did now because, you know, my father could afford that, but I can. But remember when you're doing that, that there is a point where you will take something away from that. No, I don't believe in punishing people and things like that. You know, my, my, my kids didn't have a paper round either. Although I did make them dig the garden occasionally and they're both girls. So. <laughs> um. Reaching the finals, uh, the European Championship, you, you sometimes hear about exactly this point about the hunger and the, uh, the, the benefits of being the underdog, but uh, you also hear talked about the benefits of having some experience of going to finals. Now you have been, you have quite extensive uh, experience of both as a coach and as, as a player reaching the highest possible stages, and, and how important is having uh, been there before? Yeah, I mean. I had a really difficult time with it because I got injured, so I only played 21 minutes in a World Cup. But uh, whatever you sort of plan and however good your planning is, you know, there is only one thing that really has to happen, and that is you have to win. You know, you can play terrible and win in football, and the whole world is okay. If you, if you play really well and you lose, the world caves in, and yet, your performance, if you're a coach, you think, we played really well today. But that's, that's the secret. If you're England manager, there's only one way to, to really succeed, and that's to win. If you can, every game. You know, don't try losing one. That's a bit of a big problem. So it's simple football. You know, it's, it's a, a simple game, som sometimes complicated by coaching. You know, and I think that's uh, everything I've heard since I've been in Iceland is that you, you coaches know what they have, and they know where the strengths are and what the strengths are. And they're playing to that. And this long-term view that you've got, it's the right one. But, you know, you still have to look after the short term in football, especially at club level, as David and myself know. It's about next Saturday and winning. It's much more, you know, rapid than any, any other sport in England, you know, uh, if, you, if you game, if you lose a game. So just to understand that. But the philosophy you have for your national team you're in good hands because it all makes sense. It really makes sense. Um, you know, one thing that um, Ramon Calderon was talking about before um, was about the, the huge appeal of football. And something which I, I've often thought is that the reason why football is not only, I think, the world's biggest sport, but probably the world's biggest subject of conversation, ir you know, away from maybe, you know, domestic matters and quarrels with your wife and your children and whatever. Um, I think it is the biggest subject of conversation if you consider the number of people who do it. And I think 
what it is, and just picking up a little bit on what uh, Kevin was just saying, is because football, more than any other sport, is like life, unfair, unjust, and you don't always get what you deserve. It's the only sport that I know when after a game is over, there is endless debate for days, for weeks, even for years or decades, <laughs> over whether the result was deserved or not. You know, I watch, you know, I did a book about Rafa Nadal, I know quite a bit about tennis. You watch Rafa Nadal, he loses against Federer, or he beats him, end of discussion. With football, there's this endless debate, was it this, because, and I think it's because, because the element of, of chance and that sort of unfairness is just is so much more present in football, which brings me to a point that I wanted to ask Kevin. Um, you know, all of us football people, we, we, we put the coaches, the managers, on, on pedestals. We give them an extraordinary centrality. We give them almost godlike powers is the kind of myth that we buy into. And yet here you are, you, you have been a, a great player, a great manager, you've seen it all. What is the point? I mean, for me, managers ultimately it's a mystery, actually, to decipher what's going on there, as someone from the outside. What really is the answer to this riddle, oh, master Kevin Keegan? Well, uh, <laughs> I really wish I knew. Um, it's, yeah. you know, there is no university you can go to to be a football manager. When I went into Newcastle, very first time, they were, when they were second bottom of the, what is now the championship, second division then, um, y you know, you've got the players you've got and you're, s you're maybe going to go down for the first time in the history in Newcastle, this is, into the third division as it then was. It's now called the first division. And I went back to a club I'd been away from 10 years and the, the, the thing I did was nothing to do with the players. The place was filthy. There were still the same stains on the bath as when I played, you know. We had, used to have the big communal baths, we still had them. I quite enjoyed that, I must be honest. And I said to the, 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 the owner of the club, when the players, I'm going to give them Monday off, I want to fumigate the place and I want to paint it and I want to clean it. And he said, you know, shouldn't you be concentrating on the playing staff? We've got 14 games to stay up. And I said, yeah, I, I should, but I want the players to come and feel they're playing for a club that's worth something. Because when a club goes backwards, everything goes. I'm sure David will tell you the same thing. You know, in Newcastle, they said, you know these players, they're not really good enough for this club, so we're not going to put them in hotels before a game. We'll travel on the day of a game. And we were, you know, Newcastle's very north. We've traveled three and a half hours to play someone. And they expect you to beat them when they're better prepared than, than you. And they've probably got better players, no. And they also then said to the players, you know what? you can take your own shirts home and wash them, right? This is Newcastle United, big club. We went, to my first game, we, some of the players played in black and white stripes, and depending on which washing powder your wife used, <laughs> <laughs> some were playing in grey and white stripes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what can happen at a, at, a, at a business or a club when things go wrong. And so I started to do the little things, and one of the players come in on the Monday, or the Tuesday, I gave them Monday off, they said, wow, and you say, well, you know, this is what it should be like. We'll get the pictures better and we get, you know, we did lots of things. It, it was a lot more things than just what was happening. And you ordered everybody to buy the same washing powder. I'm sure that would have been one important thing. <laughs> well, well, we still let them wash the shirts for another month because we didn't have it in the budget. But that's, <laughs> that's where Newcastle were, you know. So sometimes little things that don't seem so important mm. can really get the attention of players. It's not always about money, which is what we were talking about before. Some of the best things we ever did were just very simple things that the players bought into the same as what you're doing with your national side now where you know if one person went it doesn't drop apart so lots of lessons to learn from where where you're going now as a as, as a team and the lessons you learn at the tournament will be even greater you know and great value in the future there are other teams uh, going to the euros as well that have quite or, or were quite surprising which are uh, wales finally a team that has had very good players for a very long while, but finally now has a, a fantastic team that went flying through the, uh, the uh, preliminaries. And then you have Northern Ireland. Mm. Uh, quite a contrast to Wales in that they don't really have any stars, maybe similar to Iceland. Um, how do you rate their possibilities? Well, I mean, if you live in Wales, rugby is your main game. You know, this funny ball that bounces the opposite way to what you <laughs> think it is. <laughs> Gonna go. <laughs> And where if you're about 15, 16 stone, it gives you a chance to get back on the little kids who used to run around you, you know, <laughs> crush them. 
I think Wales is not a surprise to us in England. You know, they have got a very... They're, they're a little bit like you, you are in Iceland. At this moment in time, they've got 14 or 15 players who they can build a really good team around. Northern Ireland was a bigger surprise. It's sort of gone under the radar a bit because you are smaller, uh, and, and rightly so, you've had a lot more credit. But Northern Ireland qualifying is a huge boost. Republic, you know, is not such a surprise. Republic's a bigger place, there's more people. And whether you like it or not, it does help if you have more people. You know, you've got 300,000 people here. So, you know, you'd, 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 if you're looking for a, a, a football team, how many of those people are aged between 17, 18, and, 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 and say 35? You know, straight away. <laughs> so, you know, it's a numbers game to a point, and that's the other thing why it's so great what you've done. And, and um, I think you, I got a feeling you're going to go through that first group. I, I may be wrong. I'll be cheering you on until you play England, and then we're going to sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. Now, um, if there are any questions here to uh, either Kevin Keegan or John Carlin, even both of them, there are some people here in the back of the, uh, the room holding microphones. Uh, so please just reach their uh, attention and, uh, and state your name and maybe have a, a short question if there are any. I think she's standing just there behind. Everybody has the chance to ask Kevin Keegan a question and, and doesn't want to. Well, okay. Uh, I will use the, uh, all the opportunities that I have. Well, uh, John, you, you, uh, you mentioned a little bit the, uh, the effects that it can have on, on a nation to, to finally do something fantastic. You were in, uh, have been involved with South Africa quite a lot, a country that has gone through some very tough times, but then got the, uh, the World Championships. How, what did that do? Uh, the influence of football, how did that affect uh, normal people in South Africa? It might be a little bit similar, the effect of, of hosting the World Cup yeah, and no, then no, this fantastic adventure we are so having. So you talk about the 2010 World Cup yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, there, there is something of that same psychology. I mean, South Africa have got an absolute rubbish national team. I mean, it's quite, it's actually, it's, it's in, in their case, it's, it's an extraordinary case of underperforming. It's kind of the opposite of Iceland. Iceland sort of punches about this way. South Africa is by some distance the, the richest, most successful country in Africa, and yet they've got this absolute rubbish team. However, before I say that, let me just, before I answer your question, there was a time when they did do incredibly well. I, I, I did a book about the, the 1995 Rugby World Cup that was made into a movie, as you were saying, Invictus, um, later on. And that's Mandela's first year in power. And in 1996, in South Africa, they hosted the sort of the equivalent of the European Championships, the African finals in, in South Africa. South Africa had, in those days, they, they really were a total underdog, apart from anything else, had been a sports boycott, so they weren't allowed to play internationally for 30 years. Um, and so they were, they were total mega underdogs, even though they were the hosts. And for the first and only and last time in, in the history of South African football, which actually shows that success doesn't necessarily breed success, um, they got to the semi-final against Ghana, which had a really good team. They had a guy called Abeji Pele. Do you remember, Kevin? It was incredibly good. And it was one of the really great African teams that seemed as if it might make a big breakthrough. And they, were, and they had no chance, semi-finals against South Africa against Ghana. And Mandela went into the dressing room before the game and um, of the South African players, and he shook their hands. And he was just about to walk out when he turned around, this is just before the game begins, and he said, my children, I leave the country in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course is right. <laughs> Once that whistle began, the entire emotion and every sense of national identity of that team was on the pitch. Never mind Mandela, whatever, he ceases to exist. Those 11 lads are the nation, that's what happened. And they actually, and amazingly, they won 3-0. And then they played the final against, I think it was Algeria. And they won, and they were champions. But just to get back, I mean, I, I mustn't take up too much time, but uh, the 2010 World Cup, was, there was a similar sense of, of national achievement. It was the first time an African nation had hosted the World Cup. And there were a lot of people, and I found myself arguing with them, both face-to-face -face and in newspaper articles, said, oh, how can you spend all this money on the World Cup tournament and stadiums and this and that, um, when there's obviously so much poverty and health and education and what have you. These were arguments that were made by middle class or up 
um, intellectuals or chattering class people with money. You went to any you know, black township in South Africa where the people were poor, in some cases maybe walked barefoot. You asked them what they wanted, to have an extra you know, five rand spelt on health or hosting the World Cup. Get out of here. We want to have the World Cup. That's what really matters. And, and so the, the impact it had on, on national pride and identity, the very fact that they hosted it in itself was great. And the fact that actually the real story for me of the South Africa 2002 World Cup was that the football overall was actually quite disappointing. People thought that the hosts were going to let them down, but actually the host did a magnificent job. It was a very, very well, if you recall, Kevin, a very, very well organized and efficient and very happy and joyous World Cup in which the football was a pretty low standard. But I mean, it, it was just one more example of how football really can give such a tremendous boost to, to people at an individual level and as a collective, as a nation. Now we're discussing the, uh, the, uh, what we can expect from the underdogs and uh, you have played for different kinds of teams and you have managed different kinds of teams. Mm. By what I mean is sometimes you have been maybe an underdog, been this close to winning the Premier League with Newcastle. Maybe not the best squad in the league, but, but obviously the underdogs to win it from, you know, from the, 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 uh, the kickoff. Is it different? Is, is, is the feeling and the, uh, the excitement isn't different when you are expected to reach a championship or whatever it is, or being the underdog and then surprising people? Yeah, well, I w I'd start as an underdog. I, I played 174 games for Scunthorpe United in the fourth division in England. So <coughs> I know what it's like, you know, when you come out of a game and you walk in trying to hide because you got beat 3-0 and, and the, you can hear the father saying to his son, if you're not a good boy, I'm bringing you to watch them again next week, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So I had a very good grounding. You know, the, the thing I find about football more than anything is, is that it's the people you meet who you can learn so much from. And that's what days like today have been. It's like, you know, people who've been there and done it, none of us are experts. There's no such thing, you know. You've only got to listen to us talk about football and what we think and, and see how the game unfolds to know we're not experts. We try and predict things. But what it gives you a chance to do when you meet these people is learn from them. It's like reading a book. It's got 365 pages and you get a yellow marker and you just scrub away, you know, something that really resonates with you. And that would be completely different if I read a book and you read a book, what would resonate because we're different people. And that's what meeting people in football does. And that's why what is happening here now is this is just the beginning of what you're going to get the benefits from. Meeting coaches, having a coach of such experience help your next coach who has learned, as he said, so much from that. He's just gone the yellow lines there and learned so much and was very honest to it, enough to admit, had I done it, I would probably do it differently. And that's what I've been fascinated with in football. It's, it's about life. It's, that's why it's so fascinating. It's, football is a game, but there's so much more going on around it. You know, a guy called Bill Shankly, who I met at Liverpool, he, after two games training, having played 170 games in the fourth division, after two days training with the people I'd watched on TV, playing a cup final against Arsenal, unfortunately lost, and he came up and put his arm around me, and he said, son, you will play for England. There is no doubt about that. I trained two days with all these players, and you know, I knew I would. So it's that, it's those people who can make you something you're not. And you can do it in your own lives too to people. You know, sometimes instead of knocking people down, just, you know, hey, you didn't do good there, but you know, you tried your best. Sometimes it's the most fantastic thing that can happen to you. Bill Shankly made me just someone to believe in me. And, you know, I always say to people, younger people in particular, but it doesn't matter what your age is, it, you meet someone in your life who can change it. When you do, you learn from good and bad. You know, when you go out sometimes, do you learn something bad from people? You think, hold on, you know, I don't want to be like him. He's arrogant or he's, you know, it's not the way to conduct a business thing. So all you, all, every day of your life you're learning. And that's why people like today come to these things to just learn little things. We don't know it all. You've been all over the world, you speak all these languages, but you don't know it all. You're still learning. Not a lot, you know most. No, mate. But you know, know. know. So that, that's what football's taught me, is life. You know, it, it was a game, but there's so much more than a game going on. The, these players who you've got now will become coaches, and they will talk about these days and how you did it against all the odds. 
and that will inspire other players, maybe in the other countries, maybe in England. So, you know, it goes on. It's, 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 it's perpetual. And that's the great thing about sport, particular football. You know, it's, we need each other on a football field. I needed John Toshak when I was at Liverpool. He was my best mate. And you know what? We never went out for a meal together off the pitch. When we crossed that line, he was my best friend. And I'd like to think, and I'm sure he would tell you, I was his. And that's what football is. It's not about going out every night together. It's when that whistle goes, being together. And nobody's going to come between me and you, you know? So it's much more than just a game. <laughs> it's fascinating, really. I doubt we can have the last words. There's nothing we can add to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Stop right there. It yeah. says 14 seconds it left. It says 14 there. seconds. Well, uh, thank you very much, Kevin Keegan and John Carlin. Uh, we will now take a short break and we'll be here uh, back at 9.45.